let me literally be, literally be one of the first in Greenville to welcome you to Greenville, North Carolina. He is Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American Athletic Conference. And, uh, Mike, it's great to meet you in person and see you in town. Welcome to Greenville. Thank you, Troy. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You guys have given me a very warm welcome, and I've been to Greenville before. Uh, hadn't been, it's been a while, but it's great to be back. It's been what, since the 90s. I know uh, we yeah. talked in the past about your past TV experience with ESPN and most recently with CBS as a TV executive. You worked with Dave Hart back in the 90s and, and originally put that deal together when East Carolina had a deal with ESPN to broadcast games here with the Pirates uh, before that was kind of the thing to do that everybody does now. That's right, Troy. This university always had a special uh, appeal to me. I thought that the, the fan base has always been terrific. Uh, it, it was a very competitive team all those years. Uh, you know, you go back and you look at some of the great players here, and at the time Ernest Biner had, had, had played here and, and others. Uh, and I just thought East Carolina is one of the premier independent programs at the time. And I thought ESPN, if, if you know, they have six home games, why can't ESPN do each of those home games? These are going to be good games. You played good opponents. Uh, you were going to start playing the schools from North Carolina. I know that uh, I think at the time, I, as I recall, the legislature kind of mandated some games, as, as I recall. So I was very pleased to be able to put it together. My, the management at ESPN supported me. And Dave Hart, of course, was you know, a very aggressive AD, um, and he'd done a lot. Uh, he had invited me to a few of the events here. And I knew what kind of f- passion the fans had. I knew what kind of team you had, uh, and I was just really pleased to do it. And, and I'm thrilled that the East Carolina is coming into our league. They're going to be a great addition. Mike, I want to talk a lot about the future of the American. Yep. Uh, but let's, for folks that don't know you, how did you end up being in the commissioner business? Because that is a unique job, and there's only so many conferences. How did you end up being the commissioner of what was at one time the Big East, which is now, of course, the American? Well, you know, it's funny. I had been in the college uh, sports. I've been around college sports for many years, and my, most of the focus of uh, my time at CBS was college sports, and so I became deeply involved in the issues. But I didn't expect to be a commissioner. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, I got a call from uh, uh, a recruiter um, in August of 2012 regarding the Big East job, and it came out of the blue. I was in Newport. Uh, ironically, I was in Newport for a Big East, or coincidentally, for a Big East meeting, their summer uh, media session. And I got a call, and, and I guess there was some concern about some of the, I guess, the, the process and how it was going. They had a lot of candidates who weren't connected to college sports. So they felt, you know, maybe they, they could benefit by having somebody with TV background who also knew everyone in the, in the um, you know, the collegiate community. I, I'd spent a lot of time over the years with uh, Jim Delaney, Mike Slive, and others. I knew all the ADs. I had done a lot of college sports at ESPN where I did other things as well. But at CBS, concentrated mainly on college sports and then worked on that with CBS Sports Network as well as my duties at CBS. So, I, you know, I felt passionate about the issues uh, confronting college sports. I'd always felt that, uh, you know, I had a real affinity for the people. So it just seemed like a natural thing. And ultimately, you know, I did a few interviews, and they, I, it was clear that they were more seriously interested maybe than I thought they'd be. I didn't know whether I was just, uh, you know, someone they thought maybe they ought to talk to. Uh, but I, I was delighted to do it. And people have asked me subsequently, interestingly, Troy, they said, well, you know, knowing what happened and knowing would you do it again? And I said, absolutely. I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing now. You know, for six months it was really tough. But adversity is something everybody faces at some time or another, and you, you deal with it. And so I was uh, – I feel really, really fortunate to be in this, and we're facing a lot of tough issues now in college sports. No doubt. We want to talk a lot of those. Uh, most of the folks tuned in today probably are, are a lot of them would be pirate fans. So take us back, to, uh, take us kind of behind the curtain, so to speak, when all the craziness was going on uh, two years ago or so or longer. Uh, with the, It seemed like it was summertime. It was every day there was a new story coming out with this school going to this conference. I mean, it was, it was craziness. I mean, we were covering it day to day, and it was changing day to day, if not hour to hour at one point. Uh, you, you were commissioner of the Big East at that time as the Big East was losing teams, adding teams. When it, comes, when it came to East Carolina, because uh, ECU was one of the kind of the, really one of the last teams kind of to make the jump to a, a bigger conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, at first it was just football, and then it was all sports. Take us back to that process, how East Carolina got on the radar uh, with, with you and the other schools back then, and once again at the Big East, and how ECU got accepted first in football and then all sports, how it all went down. Well, you know, Troy, it's interesting. Uh, when I took the job, I knew it was fraught with risk. I, I knew I was getting into a situation that might not be smooth. I didn't know it would be quite like it, it turned out to be. I mean, I'm not a prophet. But I knew that there could be more movement. 
Uh, and sure enough, uh, and I had an inkling that Notre Dame was looking possibly to move somewhere. I, I knew that they'd been talking to some conferences. Sure enough, a week into my tenure in uh, September of 2012, they announced they were leaving. But then things seemed to settle down. And for a couple of months, I was able to really focus on, you know, building up the, uh, you know, the image of the conference. I thought there might be stability. Still had Louisville, Rutgers, and the others. Uh, and then uh, out of the blue, although we had some inkling that there might be some, some more movement, but no one had any idea what it was. Was, and it surprised everyone when Rutgers announced that they would be leaving for the Big Ten, and Maryland, a charter member of the ACC, goes to the to the Big Ten. And I knew that that would mean a, essentially a double hit for us. I knew that the ACC would then look for one of our teams, which they did. And ultimately, uh, John Swafford called me, and John and I have had a good relationship over the years. You know, we also took the high road throughout this whole process, and I think it really helped us as a conference. But John said, we're going to take one one team. We're not going to take three. We're not going to go to 16. We're only going to go to 14. He was as good as his word, and they did take Louisville. So that was a big blow to us. It was in the middle of our TV negotiation. We were getting some offers from other networks. Uh, it was a, not a good time to have that happen. And what I wanted to do is, is show that we were going to be active, that we weren't going to take this sitting down. I knew it could happen. I didn't think it would happen in the direction it did. Uh, and immediately East Carolina came to mind because they have a great football program. Now, you may recall at that time we still had all these basketball-only schools, and they wanted to – they didn't they, – they did not want us to take a group of, of basketball and football schools at that time. Uh, we did take Tulane in both sports, but – that was essentially all we were going to do at the time. But East Carolina, I thought, would, would fill a need we had for a, a football school that was a tremendous, you know, obviously a tremendous uh, institution in all respects uh, and had been on the radar uh, for a long time. We weren't really looking to expand. But once that happened, uh, it, was, it seemed to me a no-brainer. Our board approved it pretty quickly. Uh, and then... Uh, when the Catholic schools decided they'd had enough of the uh, realignment and they were buffeted by the vicissitudes of it all, and in fact, as you know, it was football-driven. It, wasn't, it didn't have much to do with basketball. And we felt they were making a mistake, and I think if you look at what happened with our league and it, you know, I'm not saying anything about theirs, but look what happened with our league and how strong it is in basketball and, and how strong it now is in football and the year-round presence. But they decided that ultimately, uh, you know, then they had, um, they, you know, they were talking to, to Fox and they had an offer, and they decided that, look, we can do better in the end as just a, a basketball league. We're, we're, you know, seven small basketball schools. We can add a few other basketball onlys, and we won't have to worry about realignment anymore. And they were pretty open with, with me on it. We had good discussions about it. And the truth is we knew that uh, ultimately it might be better in, in the end to have that happen. Uh, and once that did happen, uh, then it, it seemed also a no-brainer that East Carolina should come in in all sports. And, and I think East Carolina's got good athletic programs, and, and I think they'll be good in, in basketball. I think th this league will help them enormously in basketball, and Jeff Lebo's a terrific coach, uh, and your other sports are strong. So I felt, why not? And the board, again, readily approved that. At that point, we also extended an invitation in all sports to Tulsa. Tulane was already in the fold. That gave us 11 teams, and Navy would give us 12 in football. Navy doesn't want to play basketball. So that's basically how it came about. It was It, it was a reaction. Now, that's not to say that we would not have thought about expansion down the road, and East Carolina would have been a prime candidate. Now, this is a great university that sometimes in the whole national debate gets overlooked. But I can tell you, Troy, they're not going to get overlooked anymore because they're going to get great exposure and they're going to get great, I think, support from the conference and from the other schools. But now that all the, the dust has kind of settled on, on all that conference expansion and then you mentioned the basketball schools leaving, have, have all the exit fees is that going to be settled? Or, cause I know Maryland still has a battle kind of going on with the ACC. Is, is that kind of settled from your end as the commissioner of the teams that are going out and coming in? Good question, Jonathan. It pretty much is. Uh, we, uh, we're close on the Boise situation, getting that finalized and, and resolved, and that's pretty much it. We settled Louisville and Rutgers a while ago. Louisville, without any uh, acrimony, Rutgers sued us for some reason. We thought it was meritless, and ultimately, uh, and I commend Julie Herman for you know sitting down with me, and we worked that out. But Tom Jurich and I have been old friends for years at Louisville. We worked that out pretty quickly. It's all pretty much settled now. Yeah, you know, when you look back, the Catholic schools in the old Big East had a, a long-time relationship with Syracuse, with Boston College, with Pittsburgh, with Notre Dame, and then gradually developed one with Louisville and, uh, and Cincinnati and, of course, UConn. And they, you know, they felt they didn't have an affinity with a lot of the schools anymore, and they decided, why don't we just play basketball? Uh, that, of course, necessitated uh, just working out an arrangement with them because they had an unusual agreement uh, in, in place uh, where they could all leave kind of en masse. 
And we did work that through that. It, a lot of people thought that would blow up the league, that we wouldn't be able to get through that. You know, that it would just be a mess. And it was hard. It was very difficult to work through it, but we did. And ultimately, we had uh, we, we got all essentially the financial resources we needed, which meant that we could, uh, you know, we could operate. We'd also have – it was almost acting like a supplemental TV deal, essentially. Mm -hmm. And in, in addition to our TV deal, it keeps mm -hmm. the league uh, solvent, and we hope down the road we can increase the TV money. Talking to Mike Oresco, he's the commissioner of the American Athletic Conference. He's in town for the next couple of days to welcome – East Carolina University Athletics into the conference. That day will be officially July 1st, but uh, he's in town to recognize that and celebrate here in Greenville in person. And, uh, Mike, you, you know, you're in such a unique situation being a commissioner that you've got so much experience on the TV side of things, and you understand college athletics and especially college football, and now you can kind of marry those two with your current position now. And as you know, the lifeblood of any conference in this day and age is money, and the money is generated primarily through these multi-million dollar TV contracts. Not that there are other, aren't other revenue streams, but that's where the big money is. You mentioned that a, a lot of the shakeup was going on while you were in the middle of negotiating TV, the TV deal. And I will say, I think maybe you didn't get what you had hoped for this time around, but I think the TV deal ended up, as far as exposure-wise, with what you were able to negotiate with ESPN, tremendous. I, I look at the schedule already for East Carolina, and there's six national TV games on the ESPN networks of stations just this season and could be more uh, before the season starts. So when you look at the TV deal, how long is it for, and at what point can you kind of renegotiate now that things have settled down and say, hey, look, we do have a lot to sell here, and maybe we, we do bring more value to the uh, TV than what, what the conference is current, currently getting? I think you expressed it extremely well. That's exactly right. We think we will get more value down the road. It's a six-year deal. It's a short-term deal. As you know, many of these deals are 12 and 15 years. So we have a chance, I think, to sit down with the SPN, and I'll be talking to John Skipper in the not-too-distant future. John and I have had some good conversations. A year and a half ago, uh, fellas, you know where we were. It was it was turmoil. When you're in turmoil, you're not going to get the kind of TV deal that you want. But we did get incredible exposure, and you're absolutely right. East Carolina could be on as many, you know, they could have all their games on national uh, platforms. In fact, probably will, whether it's CBS Sports Network, whether it's ESPN, uh, their family of networks, could even have an ABC appearance. If ECU and UCF toward the end of the year is a big game, like we think it will be, uh, you know, sky's the limit for exposure. So I think that's going to help our school's brand. It's going to help our schools build their programs. But I think in terms of the deal, yes, we uh, – we think we can get more money down the road. We think we've developed a good uh, a good brand already. We had great, incredible instant success, and I think it's just a matter of time. But um, that's essentially what we're looking at. And the bowl tie-ins are a big part of that. I know you've worked hard to yeah. secure football bowl tie-ins for this conference. Yeah, we lost a few, but we picked up a, a, a several. And our bowl tie, our philosophy was was simple, Troy. It was. Let's find attractive games against attractive opponents in good locations that our fans want to go to. And we're in, and we have our own bowl. You know, we did something unique and, and I think innovative. We started our own bowl in Miami Beach, and BYU is going to be playing one of our teams the very first game. They, they're, as long as, assuming they're bowl eligible, they'll be in the game. And we're excited about that. But in the meantime, we're in St. Petersburg, we're in, in Dallas, Fort Worth. We're in uh, Boca Raton, the Bahamas. We've got a game, you know, in uh, in the Washington D.C. area. We, we're in Hawaii from time to time. We're in New Orleans from time to time. We have as many as 13 tie-ins. Uh, they're not all the same year. We'll probably have as, as anywhere from uh, six to eight most years. Uh, but it's a it's a good bowl lineup, and we're going to be playing the ACC, the SEC, the Big 12, maybe the Big 10. Uh, we're hoping that we can get the Pac-12 down to Miami Beach once in a while. We can at least try. You know, yeah. they, they don't have a, a deep bowl picture right now, and there might be. They, last year they did have a team that needed a home. And, and I guess with this new playoff format, if a team's high, ranked high enough, that could potentially be in, in the Final Four, although I know that's a, it, it's a tough task to yeah. say that's going to happen. But I, it, it is possible, right? That's going to be daunting for everyone. But, yeah, it is possible. We have two avenues, though, to, the, to that postseason. One, obviously, now look at UCF and look at what they did last year. If UCF had brought back Blake Bortles and Storm Johnson, both of whom had eligibility, I think they'd be a top five or top ten team going in. And it, it would be hard to deny them a spot in that four if, in fact, they were undefeated in our conference and played. For instance, they're playing BYU, they're playing at Missouri, and they're playing Penn State in Ireland, which we're excited about. That game is going to be in Dublin to start the season. But I think, you know, in the end, we think that, you know, we've got a shot at the four. It's going to be hard for anybody, though. It's going to be hard for the, the five conferences, the, the, the group of five. I don't... 
I consider us a power conference, so I don't refer to them as a power five. I think we're just as, as good, and we've proven it. Uh, I think down the road it's going to take some time to to build our programs, but I think we're going to get there. But in any event, we also have the host bowls. Uh, I don't know how it, how that name originated, but these are the other New Year's Day and New Year's Eve games that are part of the system, the six bowls. Three of them will, will not be tie-ins, and although their access will be somewhat limited, we have a guaranteed spot for the top team in the five conferences that we're, we're a group with. Now, you know, we have great relationships with those conferences, but, you know, obviously we'd like to be viewed closer to the other five, of course, mm-hmm. and, and they would too. But nevertheless, if we're the highest-ranked team of the Mountain West, Conference USA, the MAC, and the Sun Belt, and last year we would have been, UCF would have been the highest-ranked team, then we have an automatic bid to either the Fiesta the uh, formerly beach. BCS type bowl exactly yeah. it, it essentially would be considered the BCS uh, equivalents and now the whole thing's going to be called the college football playoff I don't know frankly what those those other games are going to be called but we have access and I think again if you look at this conference and, and ECU will be a prime contender you know this year alone Houston ECU Cincinnati and UCF are going to be very strong and you're not going to overlook U- USF for long because you know Willie had the best recruiting class apparently in the conference. Uh, a school that's big and has resources, has a history of success. Uh, we're going to be a very strong conference. Bob Diaco coming over, Notre Dame defensive coordinator, taking the UConn job. And I haven't mentioned three or four of our other schools that are going to be in the mix. you got uh, East Carolina, Tulsa, and Tulane getting ready to join your conference. And uh, you got your existing members. You have the national champions in basketball, both men and women's, and UConn, UCF. You mentioned their great football year last year. What, what are the, the, the members pressing you for, saying, hey, Commissioner Mike Oresco, we, we need this. We want this. What, what are the, some of the issues they're pushing you to uh, get accomplished? Great, great question, Jonathan. They are very pleased with where we are. They're very pleased with the amount of exposure we're going to get and we have gotten. They're very pleased with the amount of promotion we do r- around the conference. Or, you know, we're out there tirelessly promoting the conference. What they'd like me to do is look into whether we can do anything right now about the TV situation, uh, only you know, to see whether th- – I've suggested to them that there might be a way where possibly we – since we have such a short-term deal that you know, we talk to ESPN. I'm not guaranteeing anything, and I'm leading no one down the primrose path. We don't have you know, uh, an absolute guaranteed reopener. But we have the opportunity, perhaps, to extend it out. And to re- now that we've proven ourselves and we show, we've shown what kind of potential we have, so that's one of the issues we're all looking at. And I think they're looking to us basically to uh, to help them in any way we can in terms of building their programs, whether it's again through helping visiting with donors and and you know getting donors excited about the conference. Uh, and I try to get around all the schools as much as possible, uh, making sure our conference office is run extremely efficiently as you know uh, when your resources aren't as great as those other guys you have to be smarter and our schools have to be smarter in the way they use their resources so does the conference I think they think we have a very well-run conference now Rick Pitino upon leaving said it was a well-run conference Larry Brown said in the New York Times it was a great great conference I think uh, you know we have a, a great deal of potential they also want us to continue to be innovative they like the Miami Beach Bowl we're, we're going to be uh, fine financially with it it's going to provide us with a long-term destination for one of our teams uh, they like the idea of the UCF Dublin game. Um, you know, there's some exciting things we're doing uh, in basketball. I think we're we're going to help the schools get their RPIs up. You know, we don't want to have another situation like SMU. We thought SMU should have been in the tournament. We really felt they deserved it. But unfortunately, our our league was in transition, and our RPI wasn't as good as it, it could have been. In the future, we'll just make sure that that kind of thing can't happen, even though we felt that SMU was deserving. So things of that nature, Jonathan, those are the things they're going to look to us to do. Mike Oresco, our special guest today as we come to you here on Pirate Radio, live at 5. He is the commissioner of the American Athletic Conference. This is uh, Mike's first live media appearance in Greenville, and we appreciate him sharing some time with us and uh, talking with the Pirate Nation today. Mike, you, you talked. there's been a class system in, in major college athletics, especially football, for a long time. And, and when I say that, I mean there's been BCS and non-BCS. We finally get rid of the BCS label, and lo and behold, they go, well, now we're the Power Five. You mentioned it earlier. You don't even like using that term. And then there's the group of five, I think, is what they're calling everybody yeah. else. How, how do you, as commissioner, 
helped because you've, you've got a lot to sell with this conference. You've got a team that just played in a BCS football game. You've got the reigning national basketball champions and men's and women. Uh, there's a lot of good, good things that are going on in good schools that are part of the American Athletic Conference. How do you get the American to become part of the Power Six? How, how does the conference take that next step so these other schools and conferences look at American as an equal to them? Well, you know, Troy, you know, Jonathan uh, alluded to what, what are the things that our guys want. And one of the things I could have mentioned was they would certainly like me to uh, try to get this group uh, officially or at least quasi-officially into that power grouping so that it becomes the power six or it becomes the whatever equity six, whatever you want to call it. And that will be one of my goals. How do we do it? Well, first we have to keep winning. You know, you need to win. You need to show – look, TCU's in the Big 12 in part because, you know, they developed their program. They won the Rose Bowl. Uh, we need to win. We need to show that we're uh, at that level. And if we do that, I think that it's going to be hard to keep us. For instance, you know, you could argue sometimes, you know, uh, look, we won the Fiesta Bowl, and we won convincingly, and we beat the champion of the Big 12, not just another team there. We had a, a men's national champion, a women's national champion, a finalist in the NIT. We won the women's NIT. We had a college World Series team. You know, we've done a lot. Second, we have to increase our resources. But we also have to show that we're going to do the same things for our student-athletes that they're going to do. You know, ostensibly, and I do think it's very important, one of the the key reasons for this autonomous movement uh, is to help student-athletes. Schools and conferences that have more resources want to be able to utilize them. They haven't been able to. They've had their hands tied to some extent. And now we think that our schools will eventually be able to do those things, that they've got the resources. They don't have the money and TV deals that the other guys have right now, but we think we can rectify that and remedy it. Um, You know, I've told our our guys, look, I'm not a miracle worker, but it's not going to take a miracle to knock that door down eventually. I think we, we think in the new governance structure, and we haven't seen the final version yet, but we've specifically asked that there be a mechanism, a structure, for entering or exiting that group. What if two main school, big schools leave a particular conference and that school, uh, that conference is no longer, you know, what it is or what it was? And you've seen that happen. Um, then there ought to be a, a way to enter and perhaps, uh, you know, somebody might end up exiting. We hope not. We hope it's just a question of us, you know, our group entering. But there, there will be a, some kind of legislative mechanism, we hope. We think there will be. And at that point, it's just up to us to, to keep, keep pounding on the door. There are probably other things we need to do, too. We need to increase attendance. You don't have that problem here. You've got a wonderful fan base, and, you know, you're close to 50,000 all the time. Uh, And I think in our conference you're going to be at 50 and you're going to sell out. Um, I think we need to, um, you know, in terms of facilities, we need to upgrade in in some of our schools. But we're we're close. You know, we – I think people look at us and and they sometimes forget. When you've got schools like East Carolina that's just always been a great program that just hasn't had the spotlight on it hadn't had the exposure. It's going to do some interesting things. Um, You look at USF and UCF, and they're they're the biggest schools almost in the country. UCF is the second largest enrollment in the country at 60,000. You know, USF, a big school. Houston, big resources. We have six schools that were either BCS schools or were in the old Southwest Conference. That gives you a nice base of guys who've already done it. Cincinnati. I mean, Cincinnati was number two in the country under uh, three in the country under, uh, you know, Brian Kelly at one point. You know, you look at UConn. There's a big athletic budget, as big as all the big guys, and, you know, has been a tremendous force in basketball and also is doing okay in football. Naval Academy will give us a great national presence. Navy's a great addition to have in, in next year. Uh, so we've got the makings. And, and schools like Memphis and Tulsa and others, Tulane, they're only going to get better in our conference. Um, one last thing I would add, guys, is, you know, I'm not someone who, you know, I'm not going to get metaphysical here, but in the old days, the Big East Conference had a knack for taking in teams that had not had the national profile and developing those teams because they were able to play at a higher level, play better competition. Now, the American Athletic Conference is not technically have a seat at, at that particular autonomy table right now. But that doesn't mean that we're not in a similar position. You know, when Cincinnati and Louisville came into this conference, they weren't even remotely like they are now. They just weren't. One of our guys went to a Thursday football game and thought maybe he had the wrong day at Cincinnati. And look at them now. Mm -hmm. Look at where they are. 
and, and you don't have that problem at East Carolina because East Carolina's got a great program that just needs to be discovered. Mm-hmm. And believe me, it will be discovered. The ESPN exposure is going to be priceless. UCF had almost every one of their games on last year. You saw them nationally beat Louisville in that come-from-behind win on Friday night. That's not something they could have done in another conference. In addition, they had a BCS bowl bid, which they wouldn't have had in another conference. And at least we have a, a still have an avenue. And because our conference is a... We, we're a higher-profile conference than people think because people look at us and say, are they going to do it? Are they going to challenge? Look what they've already done. Can they, get, can they get to the next level? And I think there's some interest there. Would, big, would bigger be better for the American Athletic Conference? Is expansion something you're looking at? Even Navy's going to be a football-only member. Are there other possible partial memberships potentially down the road? Yeah, another good question, uh, Jonathan. I think there's a possibility – that we would we would entertain expansion, but we're not actively looking to expand. There are a couple of schools who probably would add significantly to the profile of the conference, but we're not going to just take schools for the sake of it. Uh, and right now, there hasn't been much movement. You know, but that somebody did ask, would you consider taking a group of you know maybe per, perhaps high profile basketball only schools along with football? And I said, don't think we want to go that route. You know, we've done it already. It's uh, it tends to cause divisiveness because certain schools just have they have different budgets, they have different outlooks, they have different goals. On the other hand, if there were a couple of schools that, frankly, could play all sports in our conference that made sense, we would look at it. If there were some schools that played only football in our conference but it would make sense, that's something I think we would at least entertain because at that point we wouldn't have that dichotomy of basketball-only schools along and small <coughs> schools that, that, again, just want to play basketball, don't want any part of the whole football thing. We would want schools that have a big profile. Mike, we only got a couple minutes left. I know you got an event uh, with the Chancellor coming yeah, up soon. I, I don't want you to be late on my behalf. <laughs> I'll never hear the end of it if that happens. <laughs> so we'll, let's play a quick speed round uh, with you, just a few remaining items. Uh, recently you split the football conference into East-West, which I thought was a really good move. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask, well, why Cincinnati in the East and Navy in the West? Why not re- reverse those two? Well, first of all, um, Navy wanted to be in the West. Uh, Navy felt when they joined the conference they wanted to play – uh, schools like SMU, and then ultimately uh, when we took Tulane and Tulsa, these are private schools they have a lot in common with. They also wanted to play in Texas, and they wanted to play in Oklahoma, and they wanted to play in Tennessee. They said that that would be something that was important to the school, to their admissions office, not just uh, athletic um, you know, admissions. So they wanted to play in the West, and Cincinnati wanted to play in the East because that's where their natural rivals have been. You know, uh, East Carolina uh, will, will obviously become one, but UConn, and USF, obviously, they were a team Cincinnati had gotten used to playing, so they felt comfortable being in the East. And uh, it worked out perfectly because uh, it does basically break down on East-West lines. And Navy is a national institution, as we all know. I mean, they're obviously, uh, they have a national profile. And so I think, uh, you know, we have, uh, I think, good balance. I think you're going to see some really good competitive games. And this also... By going east-west and doing an eight-game schedule, essentially you play your five divisional opponents and then three from the other conference on a two-year rotation, then the other three. You avoid the permanent opponent uh, issue. We looked at it, and we thought about that. We thought, well, if we had to scramble this a bit, we could we could potentially separate the Florida schools, but they'd have to play each other all year. And if we separated the Texas schools, they'd have to play each other Excuse me, every season, meaning obviously you'd have to have a permanent opponent. And you look at the SEC, and after all these years, there's still an issue about permanent opponents, you know, whether the LSU controversy mm-hmm. this year. So permanent opponents was something that didn't, to us, appear to be attractive. And uh, I think I like this I like this look. I like the divisional setup, and I think it'll work. I know some of you will be working on uh, is future homes for the basketball tournament and baseball tournament uh, long term. Any chance East Carolina could host a, uh, the American Baseball tournament. Sure, they could. Absolutely, we're we're very open to. to have, they have a great program, and we're absolutely open to it. And uh, football, in terms of uh, excuse me, basketball, we we're going to be in Hartford this year, which I think is is a great move because of uh, the UConn profile and everything else. Uh, and the men then go to Orlando for two years, and and we got a huge uh, bid from Orlando. They they were very aggressive, uh, very, you know, and that just shows the progress we made in one year. And then the women are at Mohegan. The women drew thirty three thousand fans to their tournament which is far better than any other women's tournament. So we think we may well stay there. Um, everybody loved the place. All the schools that came in, even though the, they had to come from some distance, 
really enjoyed being there, and they got to play in front of great crowds, and not just for the UConn women's games, for other teams as well. Mike, got a lot of people plugged in throughout the Pirate Nation. Might be hearing you for the first time uh, before we let you go. What's your What's your message to the East Carolina Pirate fan base? My message is you have uh, you've you've shown wonderful support for this university and this team in football, your teams in basketball and Olympic sports. Uh, we're just thrilled to have you. We're thrilled that you're in the league. We think that, that East Carolina will be a great addition. We know that this is going to raise the profile of not only East Carolina, uh, their athletic teams, but the, the university. Uh, and we know that you have great leadership in Steve Ballard and Jeff Comfer. Uh, you have great coaches. You always have had great coaches. And I think that uh, it's just going to be a, a great, great relationship. We're very excited. And I just salute you. I salute all the support you've shown all these years. And, you know, the – you know, it, it didn't matter that you didn't have the, the profile of an Alabama or a Michigan. It didn't matter. You love this team. Uh, you love this program. Uh, there's real tradition here. We're just thrilled to have to be in the conference. Will you be back for a game this football season? Oh, absolutely. And Jeff and I have talked about October 4th um, when the, the first conference game against SMU. I, I'll probably get to another one, but uh, SMU comes here, and that will be the first American conference game. And uh I think Jeff's got some things planned, and I'll, uh, I'll almost definitely be here then. Well, Mike, it's great to have you in Greenville, and it's tremendous that we're able to share so much time with you here in the studio on Pirate Radio. We'll hope you join us again next time when I feel like we just uh, got started. But uh, we know you've got a lot more to do. We could, we could talk hours about this stuff. but uh, You know, Troy, we could, and I've enjoyed it a lot. In fact, I wish I could, but you know, I, I don't want to keep Dr. Bell. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you go. Plan. Hope to hook up with you again when you're back in town. So Absolutely. I hope this is the first of many, many visits to Greenville. And let me, first of all, say thank you for what you've done for East Carolina. I don't think East Carolina would be in the American without your leadership and effort and uh, all those folks that worked hard behind the scenes at ECU to uh, get us to this point. I think this is a great move for the program, and we're excited to be able to cover it. Well, thank you, Troy. Thank you, Jonathan. And, again, credit goes also to Dr. Ballard and Terry Holland, who was here at the time. And Jeff Comfort came in and just took the ball and, and ran with it. Now, we're, we're really excited. I'm, I'm very pleased. I love this university. You've done a great job over the years. I still have fond memories of that 91-96 period when I was at ESPN. And, That's uh, Good luck.